I'm going to introduce to you now uh, Lucinda Hartley. Uh, so Lucinda, I have a very formal introduction for her, but I actually have a more informal one. Um, Lucinda actually is an incredibly well-known expert in placemaking. She uh, travels the world to, to speak and to work. She has lots of favourite cities, actually. But her current uh, two favourite cities this year, noting that it is only uh, early March in 2018, are uh, Penang Peng and Nairobi, actually. And, and the reason is that they're both fast-growing cities in emerging economies. I will encourage you to ask any question. There is not a bad question of her. Tap into her wisdom. She will be here for the rest of the day. We'll have her up and down. Um, but this is your opportunity to fill your brains with as much knowledge and, and uh, worldly experience as we can. Thank you, Lucinda. Thank you so much for having me here. Certainly, uh, I think my worldview has very much been shaped by different places uh, where I have lived. But I, I think, and it's great to be in some ways first today, what I am really passionate about and want to speak about today is how we build a culture of doing things ourselves. How we revitalize places truly from the ground up. Uh, starting with what we could do this weekend and next month and next year. And then starting to think about three years, five years, 20 years. Because I think there is an enormous capacity just in this room uh, with amazing ideas, thank you, and inspiration uh, for what we can achieve together. Um, placemaking is a very strange word. I'm gonna take a guess that your favorite places, local or far, were places that were either naturally beautiful or that you had a connection to people, family, friends, relationships, or there was some kind of activity going on there that uh, you liked that made you connected to that place. And I think the places that we love and feel connected to are full of stories and meaning, and that's what really shapes places that uh, are great. Um, Co-Design Studio is an organisation that looks at how we uncover those stories and how we integrate those kinds of meaning uh, into places. Uh, and I want to talk today about what's happening around the world in that space with some trends and also some opportunities uh, that I can see for, for Logan Village. Um, we've worked in 100 neighbourhoods around Australia, looking at a range of often temporary activations, but projects that bring people together and create new social relationships and new stories. And it's from that perspective that I wanna uh, talk today. And the question uh, amongst those projects that we've been asking is, what is it, what's required to shape neighborhoods that really thrive? What are the characteristics of those types of neighborhoods? And I think sometimes we have a discrepancy between what we plan for and what happens in reality. And so what is it that we need to be doing to change that story? And this is where I think placemaking is critical because on the one hand we have planning and I've spent a decade in urban design, I understand about planning, it's extremely important. But we also have the emotional brief. How does a place feel? What's its meaning, its story, its heritage, its culture? What will make people connect in that place? What will make it inclusive to bring in new people and new stories? And that might sound like common sense, but in fact, there are really specific strategies that we can look at to make that happen more easily. Um, what I'm not talking about is just rolling out pop-up spaces uh, because. And I think often when we talk about placemaking, I think what it's known for is temporary activation and that can be an incredibly powerful tool, but it's not just trying to fix a space with fake grass because that's not actually the reason why a place isn't working. If you looked at this place and tried to understand why it's not working, you might discover that uh, it doesn't really have a very diverse mix of uses or it's, um, you know, it's got all kinds of other perhaps socioeconomic factors going on and, and fake grass won't necessarily fix it. It might in some other circumstances. So we're not talking about this kind of placemaking. Uh, we're talking about places that will actually build community and social inclusion. 
So one definition that uh, I think is useful is by a group called Project for Public Spaces and it's a process of leveraging or taking a town's existing uh, assets to make people, places where people want to connect and use. So it's about starting with what we have right now. Uh, understanding that we have an aspiration to shape what's different in the future but not uh, undermining the amazing capacity, resources, networks, volunteer time, ideas that we have in this room today as a starting point. So where placemaking is particularly useful is, is in terms of place transition. So all places, what we know is constant is change and all places are transitioning. But placemaking can be a tool to make that transition easier. So, you know, we have a current place, we have some form of future place and a transitional phase, which is where temporary activation is most useful in terms of shifting behaviour, ideas, uh, built environment and form. And Jamie Lerner, a former mayor of Curitiba in Brazil, but he thinks that you can achieve that transition in most instances within three years. Now, certainly there are some infrastructure challenges that will be longer than that. But in terms of transforming streets, public spaces, local amenities, he thinks a lot of change can happen within three years if you mobilise communities. And I think that's a really nice vision to kind of begin with in that regard. So what's happening in placemaking around the world? And I just want to touch on sort of five kind of key themes that are, are, are coming through. And then I want to talk very locally about what's happening here. Um, so the first one is there is a, a real dialogue around a return to localism, which might seem strange in a global economy where people are more mobile than ever, but that's actually making local places more important than ever. Because Logan isn't just competing with Brisbane, Brisbane is competing with San Francisco and New York. Places are becoming globally connected, but therefore the local identity and the local place is even more important. And there's a, a whole lot of writing by an author called Bruce Katz on this, who's, who's written a book on you know, how cities can thrive in this new age. Um, but I think to, to think about what this means locally, I think it's less about what the statements are, although we need to sort of certainly have a strong vision around the kind of um, place that we want to have. And it's much more about trying to think about one key question, and that's what can we be best in the world at? And if you look at this example in the background, it's a really uh, interesting one, a small village in the UK uh, called Hay on Wye, and they looked at themselves declining local economy and thought, what can we be best in the world at? And they had a really fantastic secondhand bookstore that drew a lot of people from around the region. They're like, let's build on that. And they have now become a European centre of secondhand books where there are secondhand bookstores in so many shops that they now have them on the street. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is your strategy, <laughs> but I think it's a very interesting proposition to, rather than sort of generically think about what would make places active and vibrant, is to think about what is the unique value proposition of Logan Village. And I think already today we've heard some really unique stories and opportunities there to leverage um, the second one is adaptive reuse and looking at what's here. And I am going to show you an example that may seem out of context and I'll explain why it is in a minute. Can anyone tell me where that is? Yeah, is the High Line before it was constructed in New York. Now, so why am I showing you an example from New York? Why is that relevant? I think what you might not know about this project is that it was organised by a community group. It is owned privately still. It is owned by the Friends of the High Line. And they petitioned to get $150 million redevelopment in their neighbourhood because they felt that that was really critically important. And there's a number of stories you can talk about the High Line, of how it's led to gentrification, how it's led to value uplift, all kinds of other things. There's positives and negative stories around it. But what I think is particularly interesting is sometimes when we think about community projects, we think about local community gardens, which are great, and I want to talk a lot about projects like that today. But think, this is a community group just like you. This is where they began, and that's what they achieved. Uh, other projects, this is one that we worked on in Rotterdam, and if anyone's from the council here, don't look too closely. Um, we built this in a weekend. <laughs> Um, but this was a temporary transformative project about looking how we could you know, adapt and reuse a public space that was underutilised with no additional resources and in two days. So there are smaller scales as well. The third trend that we see uh, emerging, um, certainly I'm sure you've seen this in and around Logan, Brisbane and around the world, but um, 
a, a move towards short-term action and, and temporary projects. Um, now, these are praised in some ways, criticised in others, but where their role is that I think is useful is that they allow us to actually test ideas without making huge financial commitments. So if you want to test if something's going to work, maybe you want to spend five or $10,000 on a pop-up park rather than 200000 on a permanent park to see if it's going to work first. Um, and I think the interesting thing about that is that you wouldn't um, create a 50-year plan for an iPhone because we don't know what the technology is or how we're going to live in 50 years' time. And in the same way, we could apply that kind of thinking to cities. We need key directions for the future, but plans like this, and I'm putting this up there because I actually worked on it, so I'm allowed to sort of criticise this one, but went down to the level of what kind of colour your fence can be. In 50 years' time, we don't know. I think what's interesting is you can actually transform places in an hour. You can transform them in a weekend, such as this community festival in St Albans, or for a summer, such as this park in Yarraville, which was a temporary trial closure of a main street, to see what impact that would have on local traffic and local trade before they invested in a permanent park because it was so popular. So a traditional post approach to planning you know, looks at setting the vision, designing and delivering it, and that has merit in many ways. I'm not suggesting that we get, away, get rid of planning. Um, but sometimes we may not want to design all the detail for the future. We may want to think about what we can do now because kind of a linear approach can be difficult to engage with as opposed to a more iterative approach, which is perhaps a tactical approach. This, this approach is called tactical urbanism if you just want more jargon to put in. So as we start with a plan, but we think about what we can test, we measure the impact of that test and we use that to change our plan. So it's a really iterative live document that's changing all the time. And it has a lot of input from a lot of different stakeholders. The way that that, can, uh, that approach can link into a planning strategy is if we look at, um, this is a project that we worked on for City of Greater Geelong, uh, where we started with a current place. So it had a vision to improve cycling in the city. It was a 10 year strategy. Uh, it had a certain budget attached. Then you know, there was an end game around what they would actually build. But there was a lot of resistance to installing bike lanes in the main street because it meant removing car parking, it meant you know, a lot of change. And so we did two different trial projects, one just for a weekend where we engaged a lot of local cycling interest groups to look at citywide engagement, and then a more permanent prototype that was there for three months over the summer. And we were, you know, this was installed uh, for you know, fairly low cost budget compared to the outcome and was actually able to use time-lapse photography, visitor surveys, other feedback to look at how people's perceptions of this place changed and how behaviour changed. And it resulted in quite a significant saving on their long-term planning strategy because they were able to uh, leverage uh, di a different outcome. And interestingly, the unexpected outcome that they achieved in this instance was uh, a lot of the car parking spaces that, you know, that they were worried about losing, actually the young people became the greatest advocates for those spaces uh, because they, for the first time, had a space in the main street that they didn't have to pay for anything to use and they were used a lot. Uh, so yes, they lost a car park, but they gained a whole new user group to the main street. So this is how a tactical approach can sort of integrate with a planning strategy. Um, urban DIY, the fourth one. Um, what would it look like if you applied a DIY approach to your neighbourhood? And this is the Everton bus shelter, which is in northern Victoria, and I love it because it changes every month. Um, there was recently a brand new bus stop built uh, next to it, uh, and this one was proposed for decommission. And there was such enormous outrage that they got rid of the new bus stop and have gone back to the old one uh, for reasons that you can see. But you can't put a value on the kind of meaning and story that you get from that sense of local identity from that place. People will specifically drive down that street just to see what's happening at the Everton bus stop that particular weekend. Uh, there are other examples of doing similar approaches to temporary bike lanes, and this one's the Better Block movement, very popular in the US, and there have been some trial projects here of looking at prototyping Main Street changes, such as what we did in Geelong. Um, and simple chalk art, other projects, recycled materials, ways to create new spaces in short amounts of time. And finally, and I think this is really interesting emergence, is that there is, 
in, in a sort of digitally connected age, uh, an emergence of new financing models for how you might go about achieving some of these projects. And there are platforms overseas like PRB and IOB, which allow you to either share materials or donate to local projects uh, or shareable, which is creating a crowdfunding approach to financing local projects. And I'm really excited to say that in later this year, we will be piloting the IOB model through the neighborhood project here, allowing sort of tax deductible donations to projects in your community uh, that will enable you to put your money where you, with what you want to see built. Uh, this kind of approach was used uh, to crowdfund a little bit similar to the High Line, uh, but the Peckham Coal Line uh, in London. And again, I think there's just a real great example of what communities can achieve. So based on, I think, what's happening around, uh, I think there are very practical applications for what I've learned about Logan Village, and I would love to hear your thoughts and insights today. Uh, one is that we can activate underutilised spaces and create new value quite quickly. Certainly we should be planning for how we should do it in the long term as well. Um, but 30% of land is vacant or underutilised on average in Australian cities. Um, I'm not sure how that compares exactly to here, but it's a huge opportunity for uh, how we can transform place and create local identity. Um, an example of that is a project we worked on in the, uh, called the Brooklyn Dog Park. Brooklyn is Melbourne's most polluted suburb. It's uh, a greenfield area uh, and uh, changing very quickly. And this community group came together to run a pilot dog park in what was a very underutilised and quite unsafe public open space. Uh, for a few thousand dollars they uh, ran um, some events and then they put up the, a fence for a temporary dog park for eight weeks and the entire project was worth it just for their advertising flyer. Um, we're going to build the greatest dog park, it's going to be great, the best ever built and the cats are going to pay for it. And uh, I'm, you know, I think we could take a lesson from them. But they used that temporary dog park to build a whole community around it. Uh, who knew there were so many dog owners in Brooklyn? They created a Facebook page, local surveys, and this became a real anchor for their community. It was built for about $3,500. And there were people like Dave, who was really disheartened with Brooklyn because he'd lived there his whole life and he thought all his friends were dead. And he actually met someone else and made a new friend <laughs> through this project. Um, and, yeah, a lot of other people discovered new friends and family, you know, uh, through their dogs and I guess the evidence that they built through this park led to uh, the council approving a permanent dog park uh, in that place and committing long-term funding for it. Um, other projects and I'm just showing this one because it's a very similar population, Tarwan in Morwell in Victoria uh, run a pop-up in their main street which increased trade uh, by 30% with local traders by having an activation there over the summer. Uh, Main Street Revitalisations, I think, is a really interesting way of looking at revitalising character. And this is a project in Edith Vale, and this is what it looked like six months ago. Uh, and some residents who lived in the area long term took out a lease on a shop and decided that they needed to do something about that. So they mobilised a local network to look at a placemaking strategy for Edith Vale. Uh, they all came together. They had a hundred different volunteers who've been involved in painting uh, Edith Vale and installing new signage and really unique uh, flavour and character to what that place uh, has become. And now you can drive past on the freeway and say, relax, you're in Edith Vale. Um, this is the last one and then I'll uh, pause for questions. But uh, I think through all these projects, yes, they have physical outcomes. Yes, they're tests and trials to build for long-term change significantly. But I think, I hope you're picking up that the primary goal or outcome is the community strengthening uh, benefits that you get from working in this way. Uh, and ultimately, if we're talking about what makes a destination and local character, it's people. It's their stories and memories and a cultural identity. And uh, that community strengthening aspect is really critical. And this is a project we worked on in Cardinia Lakes. Uh, it's a greenfield suburb, the very, very edge of Melbourne. Uh, and they, you know, pe people were very happy there. They score very high on their kind of well-being ratings, but they did have one problem, and that's that they felt that the public spaces weren't their own. Uh, they felt that they'd sort of been delivered for them, but they didn't have a sense of personality or identity there. And so their idea was to run a, a community arts festival uh, where they could uh, install their own art in a public place. Um, you know, love it, hate it, whatever it is, it, it created a whole different story around what this place was uh, for these residents. 
And the interesting outcome for, for us is not is to see not so much the artwork itself, although that's significant, but more that these residents who didn't know each other before came together, did this project, and now they've formed a residence association. They're now running our, their own program of placemaking events, this um, ongoing, and that's the key outcome, I think, is the social capital that can be built from working in a more collaborative way. Um, the, the projects that I've been talking about today are part of the Neighbourhood Project, which is a community strengthening project which looks at how we actually strengthen and organise community groups to take greater leadership uh, in shaping placemaking projects. And um, that's what I want to finish on today. So thank you very much for your time and having me. So we're going to look, let's take advantage of Lucinda while we've got her here. Um, we want to open it up to questions because there were some amazing ideas there. I would not love to know a thousand things, but I suspect you probably have more burning questions uh, than me. And so we've got about 10 minutes to ask questions of Lucinda, to tap into her knowledge of anywhere around the world. I'm keen to know how these things happen. What's the spark? But you will have other questions. So I've got a roving mic and Mark also is running around. So who would like to ask Lucinda a question while we've got her here? around placemaking. Yeah, just talking about Nom Pen, it's very primitive. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure, you can see they've started it and they keep starting bits and pieces, but it doesn't seem to get finished. And there's, um, you really actually have to dodge the infrastructure that hasn't been finished, otherwise you could die. Yeah. <laughs> That's very true. Um, I spent a year and a half living in Phnom Penh, but it's, um, what I have, one of my greatest inspirations that has come from there is, um, is perhaps at the, the other end of the scale. And there is certainly a lot of governance, financing, pipeline, project management challenges around the major infrastructure that's tr trying to be rapidly retrofitted, like 10, you know, eight to 10 million people, no sewerage network, no public transport network. How do you catch up on that in 20 years? Enormously uh, challenging and that's, uh, a challenge that I'll acknowledge, but perhaps what, what I, I feel particularly inspired by is I was working there on slum resettlement, so a lot of the byproduct of some of this infrastructure is that, uh, you know, families who've been living in places for 40, 50 years are uh, being forcibly evicted and removed. Um, there is a very different system around land, land ownership and squatters' rights and things like that. But what I saw in a lot of these neighbourhoods that people were coming together who had no land no money and really literally no resources, but were actually creating new public spaces for themselves. They were organising themselves, they were pulling like recycled materials that they had, they were deciding that they would, you know, organising their own waste management strategy and that just made me think if that's what you can achieve with really literally nothing, imagine what we can do. And we could do so much more than we do. So I, that's, I guess that's my view of Phnom Penh. I actually feel really inspired about the opportunity of like, you know, human nature <laughs> and, and what we can do together. Uh, it's not actually a question. It is, uh, we went visiting WA about 18 months ago and I'm, we were just highly impressed about the way they kept their roads, yes. the way that they, everywhere you went was tidy clean, uh, bright, and it was, it is quite disappointing to be back looking at what we have here, which is a tremendous, a tremendous abundance of assets, but we're not actually looking after what we have. Yep. If we could make uh, something like the tidiest town, yep. amazing. Logan Village, the tidiest town, keep our mowing down, keep our curbs clean, keep our rubbish in the right place. The whole view of Logan Village and surrounds, and I'm talking Yarrabilba, I'm talking uh, even further on towards Waterford, Tambourine, the whole area would benefit mm. from keeping this place as neat as a pin and looked after. Great idea. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Just got a quick question. A lot of residents come to me and they talk to me about Yarrabilba springing out of the earth. And yep. Yarrabilba is perhaps less than 10 minutes up the road. And we know we're going to have a population there that's going to be similar to the size of Gladstone. And people are very anxious about losing what makes the village interesting, unique, special. How can we best discover what that is about ourselves mm. and then to leverage those mm. opportunities for ourselves? 
Yeah, I mean, it sounds like even just with the people that you've got in the room today that there is a lot of that already here. But I think the the way that we often look at um, community mobilisation is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the innovation curve, that's about like 10% like of people who really lead things. And if they lead, then the next 30 or 40% will come along. And then you might get the next 20%. And there's 15% who just never come along and don't even bother. Um, but I'm assuming you're probably in the early adopter category if you've decided to give up your Wednesday and be here. Um, and starting with those ideas and you know, each of you would be connected to 10, 20 other people who could be involved. Uh, and there's really, and I think visibly starting with activities that create visible change creates enormous momentum, even if it's incredibly small, even if it's chalk or, um, you know, pop-up park or something like that. I think it, it, it creates signs that there's something happening here that I want to be a part of, and that's a way of looping in perhaps the next tier of people who um, perhaps, you know, are unable to give up a day to come to a workshop and participate in the formal process, but might like to get involved in uh, shaping neighbourhoods. So that, that's where we would begin. But I think, um, wow, what an incredible history and stories that you have here. And if there are ways to make that visible in some way that, you know, being from Melbourne, if I could walk through your town and know about some of that history just by being here, uh, and I, you know, it could be through signage, but that's a very obvious solution. I think there's way more creative ways of showcasing that history and those stories, and your, you know, your own lived experience that we could see here, and um, that would make me want to come back instantly. Yeah. So, do we have any other questions? Uh, would it be possible, and I think it would be, uh, to turn the town drain into a canal? It takes only the overload of, of rain rainfall to take it onto the floodlands and north of Quincy Creek Road is already turned into a canal by a private, a privately owned property person and it really is a stark change from weeds growing up the side of an unkept area. Um, it's, it's not a matter of taking grey water out, it just takes the rainfall out. I'm not an engineer, but I imagine that's possible. And certainly I think what we see in a lot of new developments is a deliberate approach to creating water sensitive places, um, looking at you know, your green not just being a public open space, but a catchment area that helps to filter and treat your rainfall so it's not going off in runoff. And uh, there's many functional uh, design strategies around water sensitive urban design. And you know, it would just be a matter of how and when I think, but it sounds like I think it could be possible. I do have one question, and it's important for the rest of the day, which is what's holding us back? And I don't mean just us in this room, but us people generally. What holds us back from doing these things when we could walk out tomorrow and, and do a whole bunch of them? Uh, I, I think about that question so much because somehow, and this is, I, I actually do think it's a uniquely Australian problem, we don't have a culture of permission. Uh, some of the projects I showed today and many others, particularly my colleagues doing similar work in the US, they said that, you know, actually my Canadian, so not US, my Canadian colleagues, they said, do you have a problem where sometimes you're working on a neighbourhood project and all the neighbourhood volunteers from the other neighbourhoods want to come and work on your project and they take over? And I'm like, we have never had that problem. Um, and somehow, somehow there's a cultural... Uh, and I don't know where this came from because we didn't used to be like that, but we tend to sort of think it's someone else's problem or, oh, we should tell the council about that or, or we should tell someone else about that. And certainly the council has a key role in coordinating that long-term strategy in the larger projects. But there's so much that we could do rather than just sort of presenting a wish list. And to me, there's sort of a cultural barrier there somehow around getting started that's, that's somehow more difficult in our culture than others I've seen. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, I do think it can be difficult. I've been arrested for drawing chalk on the road. Uh, I have spent six months trying to get permits for pop-up spaces. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes when you do have an idea to start because there can be process involved that makes it prohibitively complicated or expensive. Um, and it's not that we don't need permits for larger projects, but sometimes we might want to think about relaxing them for very low risk sort of temporary projects. So there's that both ends of the spectrum uh, around process review. And a lot of our work now is actually working with local government around what their user experience is and the interface with how they can um, you know, enable some of those ideas more simply. 
Um, one of the things uh, that I've learned in life, oh, my name's Greg Serro, by the way, <coughs> um, is once you lose something, you can never get it back. And when things are taken from you, uh, you take away what you're talking about, the, the um, facilities or even just the knowledge that you have something special here. Mm. We had a train that could go from Beanley to Bow Desert, okay? That was fantastic. We had people here every weekend taking the train from one place to another. It was just the most wonderful thing. The council, I'm not sorry, not the council, the state government has just torn the whole thing up. Once it's gone, it never comes back. You can't get a train now. You're not going to. Everything that's taken from you is gone forever. And that's the whole problem with all of this. We're talking about something that's already started. Uh, there's some things, I'm in the fire brigade, there are some things about that place that worries us. Okay? And um, I believe that we need to be more careful to keep what we have and perhaps even talk about trying to get that train or that rail track back because it would give Logan Village a fantastic identity. There are people breaking their necks to go up to uh, Imbal and on that train ride up there. Um, and it's something fantastic. I reckon it's worth more than it would cost to fix that up. Mm. And I think it's really important. <laughs> I would just say it might be. I would say the only thing I'd say to that is I think it's a very interesting and I, I've um, there the name of the group escapes me, but there is a community organisation south of Perth in WA who recently secured eighty million dollars in funding from the state government to get their station reinstated and the and the line reinstated. So it's possible. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that. <laughs> um, I've seen I've seen that happen recently, but I, I think you're right that it's a, it's a we're all around the world, especially in around Australian cities, we've seen rail and other public transport um, infrastructure decommissioned, and that's a huge tragedy that we're now suffering from, um, and you know an amazing opportunity. So. Thanks very much, Lucinda.